Do you know one thing we all have in common? It's failure. I mean, you failed, I failed, all of us have sinned. All of us, even the Pope, even Father Paul. But over and over in Scripture, we find a God who, although he will never, ever treat sin lightly, knows that we're only human, understands when we blow it, when we sin, even when we blow it big time. And he wants to forgive us. He's given us the sacraments of reconciliation in the Eucharist to help us. And, and the message I just want to send out to all of you is that with God, failure is never final. God wants to take our worst moments. I mean, even when we knew it was wrong and reconcile us to himself. I want to tell you a story. And this is one of the greatest men in all the Bible. His name is King David. And it was the time of year for kings to go to battle, but David stayed home. And he was walking along the roof one night, and he saw a woman taking a bath. He was attracted. He sent for her, committed adultery. Later on, found out she was pregnant, called her husband back from the war, and tried to get him to sleep with her so that when the child came, he'd think it was his own. Um, the husband didn't do it, so he sent him back to the battlefield and ordered the generals to make sure he got killed. He later married the woman, months have gone by, and God is going to intervene through the prophet Nathan. And we pick up the story in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. Let me read it to you. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, judge this case for me. In a certain town, there were two men, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had flocks and herds in great numbers, but the poor man had nothing at all except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He nourished her, and she grew up with him and his children. She shared the little food he had and drank from his cup and slept in his bosom. She was like a daughter to him. Now the rich man received a visitor, and, but he would not take from his own flocks and herds to prepare a meal for the wayfarer who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and made a meal of it for his visitor. David grew very angry with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this merits death. He shall restore the ewe lamb fourfold because he has done this and has had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan answered David, The Lord on his part has forgiven your sin. You shall not die. Now, did you notice David's response there? I mean, he's been in denial. He's been pretending. He's been lying. He's been living with a guilty conscience. And now when he sees it clearly, his response is, I have sinned against the Lord. I mean, under the law, David understood. I mean, he got it right in his face and he understood. But do you see what David did? He gets real with God. He repents. Now, let me just stop for a minute because repent is one of those churchy words, and, and I don't think many of us encounter it too often, so we're probably a little fuzzy about what it means. Um, it's a Greek compound word, repent, metanoia. Meta is a fundamental change. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from. You know, when, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, now he doesn't just glue some wings on and go around pretending to be a butterfly. Now he goes into his cocoon and he comes out an entirely new creature. You might even say the caterpillar is born again as a butterfly. Now, noia has to do with your thoughts or your mind. It's where we get our word paranoia from. So, metanoia is a change in your thinking or your perspective that's so deep and so radical 
that it changes who you are as a person. Okay, this isn't like just changing your clothes. This is understanding who God is and who you are. And because of who he is, God, and who we are, not God, trusting what he says and agreeing with him about what is right and what is wrong. I mean, no excuses, no minimizing it, not trying to justify because it's you know, not as bad as what some other people are doing. This is getting real with God. St. Augustine said, the beginning of good is the confession of evil. You do the truth. Interesting choice of word there, right? You do the truth and come to the light. So what do you do? Do what David did. I have sinned against the Lord. Get real with God. Repent. Change your perspective and line it up with God's perspective. Now, for most of us, by the way, this is the most difficult step. But without this, the next parts, they don't really work. Why? Well, look at David. I mean, he's the king, right? So he probably knows the law of Moses better than anybody. And, and the penalty under the law of Moses for adultery? Death. The penalty for murder? Death. But even knowing the rules didn't keep David from breaking it. Even the death penalty wasn't enough to stop him. Now, some of you might be thinking, you know what, I like where you're going with this, John, because I've never blown a big time. I mean, I, I've never committed adultery, and I've certainly never murdered anyone. Well, listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus says, for I tell you, if your uprightness does not surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. I mean, wait, what? That sounds pretty harsh. What's that mean? Well, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the keepers of the law, and they made a great show of how holy they were in public. But Jesus knew what was in their hearts. Elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs, you know, pretty on the outside, but inside full of nothing but death. So what Jesus is really saying is that it matters what's in our hearts. What we do is important, but why we do it is even more important. Okay, so back to King David. He's blown it big time. He's committed adultery. He's committed murder. God and David have had a conversation about his sin through the prophet Nathan. And David's gotten real with God and understands not only that he's done wrong, but why it was wrong. He's repented. And what David does next is pretty much a step-by-step -step anatomy of what the sacrament of reconciliation is. We know it is Psalm 51, and we're literally eavesdropping on David after Nathan leaves and David is alone in his room back at the palace. Let's see what he says. Psalm 51, the first two verses. Have mercy, O God, in your faithful love, in your great tenderness. Wipe away my offenses. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Well, what's David doing here? He's not cutting a deal. He's not like negotiating some, and God, I'll do this if you do that. Um, he's not reframing or minimizing, well, you know God, a lot of kings have done a lot worse. He's asking God for forgiveness. And, and there's two things, notice, that he cites. First is faithful love. The Hebrew word means God's loyal, covenant, unfailing love for us. And the second is, is God's great tenderness or compassion. And, and the Hebrew here literally means out of the womb. Like there's something deep down in God that feels what we feel. So David's saying, God, on the basis of who you are, love and compassion, Will you wash and purify and cleanse? The next thing David does, he confesses his sins. He owns his stuff. I mean, picking back up in Psalm 51, David says, For I am well aware of my offenses. My sin is constantly on my mind. Against you, you alone, I have sinned. I have done what you see to be wrong. 
Now, did David sin against Bathsheba? Yes. Did she sin against Uriah? Did he sin against Uriah, her husband? Yep. But David knows that when we wrong another person, ultimately it goes back to their creator, God. See, when we sin against another person, of course it harms our relationship with them. But David knew it also harms our relationship with God. Four times in these two sentences, he owns it. My offenses, my sin, I have sinned, I have done wrong. So just like David, we need to acknowledge it, own it, get it out in the open. I mean, how can we accept forgiveness from God for stuff that we won't even admit to? Right? And, and this isn't like wiping off the board so you can fill it up again. I mean, I remember there was a time in my life and and I was just about to sin, and I was thinking, no, 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 Holy Spirit working me. And another part of me was going like, yes, 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 right? No, 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 yes, 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 yes. And this thought came to my mind. Well, I'll just go ahead and do it. And I'll go to confession later. Did you ever think that one? It's called presumption on the grace of God. And it just might be one of the most dangerous things you can ever do. See, Genuine forgiveness means that we're genuinely repentant. Now, what David's saying is, I don't want anything to do with sin. And when you're genuinely, genuinely repentant in your heart, you're not going to play games with God. Oh, gee, thank you for forgiving that. That was pretty easy. No, that's dangerous ground. I mean, do you really want to be playing fast and loose with the almighty creator of the universe? Okay. So David's gotten real with God and repented. He's asked for forgiveness. He's owned his stuff and confessed his sin. And, and now there's a major shift in the psalm. It turns very positive. Listen to his tone. It's, it's full of confidence. You will sprinkle me with hyssop, and I will be made clean. You will wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. See, he's accepting God's forgiveness, and he's forgiving himself. You will make me hear the sound of joy and gladness. The bones you have crushed will rejoice. He knows God has removed the guilt and replaced it with joy. So he's accepting the work of God. When Nathan the prophet said, the Lord has forgiven you, David didn't go back into the palace and say, but I just can't forgive myself. Have you ever done that one? I have. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I've had things where, God, I'll never do that again. And I do it. God, I'll never, never do that again. And I do it. Lord, I promise never, never, never. And I do it. And I feel so overwhelmed and so guilty. Like, why even pray? Why ask him again? Now, I know the scripture. I know what the church teaches I know that Christ died on the cross for all my sins, past, present, and future. I know I need to agree with God, confess my sin, and accept his forgiveness. But I played the game. I just can't get over the guilt. Little sins meant be depressed two days. Big sins meant be depressed two weeks, two months. Don't pray. Don't read the Bible. Don't spend time with God. Mopey, mopey, mopey which usually led me to other sins, by the way. And then I went on a retreat to a Trappist monastery down in Georgia, and, and I sat down with one of the monks, um, Brother Elias, and he's since kind of become a spiritual coach to me. And he opened his Bible, and I thought I was going to get some comfort. <laughs> yeah, not so much, actually. I got rebuked. And Brother Elias said to me, John, how arrogant can you I'm like, I'm not arrogant. I, I just can't get over the guilt. Now, let me get this right, John, he said. God looks at your situation, and he's taken the guilt of your sin off of you and placed it all on Jesus, who allowed himself to be tortured and killed as ransom and payment for your sins. He bled and suffered and died in horrible pain for you. And you're going to tell him that's not quite good enough? I said I never thought of it like that before. Have you? I mean, are you willing to accept when you've blown it, but also accept God's forgiveness and healing? 
See, I, I, I knew in my mind that I was forgiven, but I needed to be healed in my heart and restore my relationship with God, with myself, and with the whole community. And what I needed was the sacrament of reconciliation. See, sure, when you're truly repentant and ask God for forgiveness, he forgives you, but that's not the end of it. We need healing and restoration, not only with God, but with ourselves and with the entire community and truly with all of creation. And we find that in the sacrament of reconciliation. And, and by the way, this is really important. Accepting God's forgiveness for you means that you have to accept his forgiveness for others too. Right? Remember the words of the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. See, there, there was a time in my life when someone close to me hurt me really badly. And it was an emotional hurt, but, you know, it kind of felt like I'd been gut shot. You know, like, where you're hurt so much emotionally that you actually have physical pain because of it. And I was mad. I mean, I was beyond mad. I was furious. And I stayed that way for a long time. And, and, and the whole time I was feeling like this, I was feeling kind of distant from God. I mean, I was praying. I was going to Mass. I was reading my Bible. I was religious up to my eyeballs. And I felt like God wasn't showing up. You know why? Because of this, because I was holding on to my anger. I wasn't feeling God show up in my life because I wasn't in agreement with God. And I wasn't trying to act like God acts. I hadn't forgiven this person. And what I've come to learn is God has forgiven me. I've learned that Jesus died on the cross for his sins just like he did for mine. I mean, what am I supposed to say? Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. God, thank you for forgiving me. I accept your forgiveness for me, but I don't accept it for this guy. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's the deal. Now, forgiving someone doesn't mean that we're over the hurt that they caused us. I mean, it might mean that you'll never even have a relationship with them again. Forgiveness like love is a choice. It's an action, not a feeling. When you forgive someone, you choose to give up the right to hurt them back. But it may take a long, long time until you no longer feel like hurting. Is it hard? Yeah. Can there be pain and tough issues? You bet. I mean, we need professional help? Maybe. But that's okay. Ask God for the strength to do it, and I promise you, he will show up to help you. Okay, enough about me. Let's get back to King David. So here's a quick recap. David's gotten real with God and repented. He's asked for forgiveness. He's owned his stuff and confessed his sin. He's accepted God's forgiveness and cleansing. He's forgiven himself. Now he's asking for a fresh work of grace. He prays, create a pure heart in me, God. Put a steadfast spirit in me. Great word here, by the way. It's used a couple of times in Genesis in the creation story. Barah. And it means to literally bring something out of nothing. God speaks and creates. David's asking for a miracle. Give me again the joy of your salvation and be ready to strengthen me with your spirit. What's that about? He's saying it's not about me pulling up my bootstraps and trying harder, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. No, you won't. I never did. You don't have the power. I don't have the power. David didn't have the power. God has the power, the power of his Holy Spirit. This is what we call sacramental grace. It's the power of God that he gives us through the sacraments. The power to let go of the guilt and accept his forgiveness. The power to forgive the people who have hurt us. 
the power to ask forgiveness from the people we have hurt, and the next time we're tempted to sin, the power to agree with God about what is good and what is evil, and the power to trust him and choose the good, even if we don't necessarily want to. And, and by the way, when we receive these gifts from God, they're never just for ourselves. I mean, David knew this. Look at what he says. Then, and after you do this fresh work in me, God, I shall teach thee and just your ways, and sinners will return to you. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth will proclaim your praise. See, when you really experience the love and kindness and mercy of God, when it gets down deep inside you, it changes you, and people notice. David's saying, I'm so blown away by what kind of God you are. I deserve death, but you forgave me, and not only forgave me, but healed me and restored me and strengthened me. I'm so blown away by how awesome you are that I have to tell people about it. I'm going to teach the unjust your ways. What ways? The ways of forgiveness. God, I know how sweet it is to be forgiven by you. And because of that, I'm going to forgive the people who have wronged me, who have been unjust to me. I want people to know that failure is never final with you. That there's forgiveness, cleansing, healing, and restoration available for the asking because of who you are and because of Jesus' work on the cross. But we still have to do our part. I mean, most of the work is God's, but we still have to do our part. So what do we have to do? We have to get real with God. We have to repent. We have to ask for his forgiveness. We have to own our stuff and confess our sin. Then accept God's forgiveness and healing part of which is reconciling with others, forgiving the people who have hurt us and asking for forgiveness from the people we have hurt. And finally, expect your miracle. Receive the life-changing grace that God pours out to you in the sacrament of reconciliation. May God bless us all and keep us. St. Elizabeth Ann Stephen, pray for us. And if you haven't been in a while, go to confession.